Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and I'm the Apostle for the Restoration of the original first century faith. And in this video series, we'd like to tell you the story about a young man in Scripture named Ephraim, or some people pronounce his name Ephraim. And one of the reasons we'd like to tell you this story is that his story might be your story. Because if you are a believer in the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua of Nazareth, you might just be an Ephraimite. My name is Norman Willis, and I was called to repentance on June the 6th, 1999. And since that point in time, I've been so blessed to be able to study the scriptures full time with the purpose and intention of restoring and reestablishing the original first century faith. I was raised as a Protestant, but I've, in my studies, I've come to find out that there's a lot of things that I was raised in Christendom to believe that just simply aren't backed up by the word. So what we want to do is we want to take you through the scriptures, through a study, and because we want you to be able to know what it is that you believe in why. And what we're gonna see in this study is several key points. Uh, I was raised to believe that the, when the Messiah ar arrived, that it did away with all of the prophecies prior to his arrival. But what we're gonna see is that scripture contains both genetic and spiritual blessings and the two go together. And when the Messiah arrived, it didn't do away with all of the promises and prophecies that were given in the Tanakh or the Old Testament prior to the, to the Messiah's arrival. We're also gonna see that in this genetic component, the patriarch Joseph had two sons. The older sons was named Manasseh and the younger son's name was Ephraim or Ephraim. And there's many prophecies all throughout scripture uh, covering the house of Ephraim, also called the house of Israel. And these are a reference to what are sometimes known as the lost 10 tribes of Israel. Scripture says that they're lost, but it also says that they're coming back one day. And so they have to be somewhere. And one of the things that we see is that the prophecies and the promises that are given over the house of Ephraim and the house of Israel are very similar to the parable of the prodigal son that Yeshua, our Messiah, some call him Jesus, but Yeshua gives us in the renewed covenant. So we're gonna take a look at a large body of evidence, a large body of scriptures that show the continuity, both of the spiritual blessings we receive in the new covenant and of the physical, or we might call the genetic component blessings that are given in the Tanakh or what's called the old covenant. So we're not actually gonna to get to Ephraim in this first portion. Uh, there's so much material and we want to go through in sequence. We want to cover things in order to help you understand how things play out in scripture. So in this very first video section, we're simply going to cover the history in scripture from Adam or Adam up into Ishmael, who became the father of the Muslim people. And we're going to start in the book of Genesis. Again, the very best place to start. And one of the reasons we're going to do so is that just as Yahweh tells us in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. And one of the things that I have learned since studying the scripture so intensely, the Jews have long had an understanding that the entire book of Genesis is considered prophetic in that it establishes patterns that play out over and over and over again. So whereas uh, Christians might think of prophecies in sort of a checklist fashion, you know, prophecies fulfilled and sort of check it off. What we find is that in scripture, the prophecies tend to repeat themselves. You might have a major fulfillment of prophecy. You might have other several smaller minor fulfillments of prophecy, but that the prophecies can and do recur and that many of these patterns can be known and understood simply by studying the book of Genesis. One of the patterns that we see is that when we live in Yahweh's favor, when we do the things that he tells us to do, we're in his favor and we get to live in his special land. For example, in Genesis chapter two, starting in verse 16, it says that Yahweh Elohim commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what Yahweh is saying here is, 
when we do the things that he tells us to do, we get to live in his special land and he takes care of us. And this is the pattern. But when we disobey him, he ejects us from his land and draws the sword out after us to cause us to repent. And this is seen in passages like Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. We all know that Adam and Hava, or Eve, but Hava, Adam and Hava fell and it says, so he drove out the man and he placed Caribbean, which is a type of angel or messenger, at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So Adam and Hava fell from his favor through disobedience. And if we take a look at this, Adam and Hava were at a very high level obeying, and then they disobeyed, so they fell down from his favor. And then what remains is a series of steps, and we're going to see this throughout the Old Covenant, culminating in Yeshua's return, little steps or increasing steps of obedience that cause us to return back to a condition not of his favor, because we're not going to receive his favor by obedience, or excuse me, we're not going to receive his favor by doing works, but because we obey him, then we're going to be in his favor. And that restores us to the original condition of favor. Notice that there's something to do when we want his favor. In Hebrews, Yerivrim 11 and verse 7, it says that by faith Noah, or Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with a godly or a righteous fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. So what we see is that Noah, while Adam and Hava disobeyed, Noah obeyed, and so this took a step back towards redemption and salvation. We'll see a lot more about that. I'm not talking about a works-based salvation. I'm talking about favor uh, coming as a result of obedience. And we're going to talk a lot more about that. But in Genesis 5 and verse 32, we see that Noah, when, when Noah or Noah was 500 years old, he begot three sons. One was named Shem, the other was Ham, and the third was named Japheth. Now Shem went east, Shem populated the Middle East and also went east into Asia. And so uh, Indians and Chinese, Japanese, and those of American, Native American extraction, both North and South, are basically of Shemitic stock. Ham, the name means hot with regards to the climate, went south into Africa, and Japheth went north into Europe. And this is gonna have a lot to do. Uh, we're gonna see later that Ephraim was, or at least part of the Ephraimite movement, was tied to Japheth in Europe. And one of the reasons that the Ephraimites were tied to Japheth in Europe, when we take a look at Strong's Concordance, we look up the name Japheth, and Strong's Old Testament 3315 is Japheth, and it means expansion. It's also related to the word for beauty. So when we see uh, these uh, historical, these imperialist Christian empires of Northern Europe, uh, that's where it comes from. And the reason Yahweh chose to tie the Ephraimite movement to the Yephathites is because he knew the Yephathites would expand. And so this would help expand and take the good news to the ends of the earth. But one of the most far-reaching prophecies ever to take place in Scripture uh, still needs to be fulfilled yet today is Genesis chapter 9 and verse 27, where it says, May Elohim or God enlarge Yepheth and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now notice what's talking about here is this is talking about a genetic component of the blessing. And as we're going to see, this genetic component doesn't go away just because the Messiah came and gave the good gift of the Spirit. And in fact, many people feel that this prophecy in Genesis may be fulfilled. This may be what Yeshua was speaking of in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 11, when he said, And I say to you that many will come from east and west, the places where Japheth has gone, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He says, But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into the outer darkness. And we're going to take a look in more detail about how that plays out. But what we're seeing here, the main point we're trying to make, 
is that there continues to be a genetic component to scripture that is additive, that works in conjunction with the spiritual component of scripture that's talked about in the renewed covenant and that the two go together. The one doesn't cancel out the other. So when we take a look, again, we're going to take a look at this. You might call it a, a, a Jacob's ladder returning back up to uh, Yahweh's favor in the heavens. But so Adam and Hava fell and that they, they disobeyed, excuse me, and that led to their fall and their lack of favor. And then Noah or Noah obeyed in order to save himself and his family. Now, even though he did so to save himself and his family, this was still a step in the right direction. But now we're going to see another one of the patriarchs by the name of Avram, later called Avraham, and he's going to obey, and it's going to cost him his family. So he's not going to obey and bring his family with him. He's going to obey and have to leave his family behind. So in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1, we read, Now Yahweh had said to Avram, Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So he's got to leave his home. He's got to leave his father's house. Verse 3, he says, And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And to me, this is much clearer. It's more emphatic in the Hebrew. Nivrahu uh, bacha, and will be blessed in you, all the families of the earth. So again, here's this genetic component in this early section. Uh, it's, it's not talking about Yeshua as the seed. It's just simply saying every family, every nation, and every clan is going to be blessed in you. And what this is saying is that Somehow or other, every family on earth is going to come to have something of Abraham's DNA, something of his genetics. It doesn't matter if you live in India, in China, in North or South America, Africa, Australia, doesn't matter. These are the promises that were given to Avraham, and they were not voided out at the time of Yeshua Messiah's coming. The Apostle Paul agrees with this. Notice in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 28, he says, he's speaking of the Pharisees or the Orthodox Jews, and he says, concerning the good news, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, he's talking about the election as given through Avraham, but concerning the, ele- the patriarchs, but concerning the election, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of Elohim are irrevocable. So what he's saying is, when the creator Yahweh pronounces a promise or pronounces a prophecy, that's not going to be revoked. It's not going to be done away with. And we're going to see a lot of evidence in this first section. And I know uh, this is hard for a lot of Christians. This was difficult for me uh, coming from the Protestant church because I'd always been taught that the genetic component was done away with. And what we see, though, in Scripture is that that's not true the genetic component continues to carry on and work together with the gift of the Spirit. So in Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 14, now we see how this happens to Avraham. It says, And Yahweh said to Avraham, after Lot had separated him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, he's talking about the land of Canaan. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. So he continues on in verse 16, and he says, And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. So what he's saying here effectively is, uh, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the dust, or we might read it, you know, anywhere there's dust, there's going to be your descendants. And we know that there's dust on every continent on earth. And this is what, uh, this is, what is being spoken of here. So we come to Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and it says that after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Avram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Avram. I am your shield your exceedingly great reward. And Avraham 
has to be confused by this point because he's just been told that his descendants are going to be like the dust of the earth, that, that anywhere there's dust, that he's going to have descendants. And so Avraham said, Yahweh Elohim, what will you give me seeing as I go childless? And the heir of my house is my servant, Eliezer of Damascus. He's saying, I, I don't see how I, I want to walk by faith, but I don't see how this is going to happen. He says, verse three, he says, for look, you've given me no offspring. For indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So Avram doesn't see how these things are going to take place. Verse four, and behold, the word of Yahweh came to him saying, this one, referring to Eliezer, shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Verse five, then he brought him outside and said, look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. First, we're counting dust. Now we're counting the stars. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And Avram believed in Yahweh and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So at this point, we don't know about Sarah's role. All we know at this particular point is Avram has learned that he's going to have an heir that's going to come from his own body. So after 10 years of trying, they still had no heir. And so we come now to Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 3. And it says, Then Sarai, later Sarah, Avram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Avram to be his wife after Avram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. And it's interesting, we'll talk more about Hagar later, and we also talk about her in the Revelation study. But when it describes Hagar as an Egyptian, uh, that can be a reference to the location, the country that she comes from. But typically, Scripture likes to describe us according to our faith. Uh, Avram is called a Hebrew, whereas Hagar is called an Egyptian. So what this probably means is that she's worshiping one of the gods that uh, was worshipped down there in Egypt. So in any event, uh, uh, Sarai gives Hagar to Avram in order to fulfill this prophecy. The prophecy, verse four. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. We can imagine the kinds of household politics that might go on in this kind of a situation. Verse five. Then Sarai said to Avram, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. When she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. Yahweh judge between you and me. So uh, because she's a maidservant, uh, she has authority to discipline her. Verse six. So Avram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Verse seven. Now the messenger of Yahweh found her, found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And one of the interesting things about this is that in scripture, anytime we see a body of water, whether whether it's water or a spring or a stream or a well, that's typically involved, involves the spirit. And so this is an early hint that we have early on. Again, establishing the end from the beginning. What we see is that uh, Hagar and her son Ishmael are going to be found next to bodies of water in this prophetic book of Genesis. And this concurs with Isaiah 11 and other places in scripture that tell us that the Muslim people are going to get brought into the covenant later on through faith in Messiah Yeshua. The genetic component never cancels out. It never does away with the need for belief in Messiah Yeshua. But the two things go together. They go hand in hand. They go arm in arm. So Genesis 16 and verse 8. And the messenger said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? So she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. And the messenger of Yahweh said to her, verse nine, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And so this again, this is what in Hebrew would be called a remez or a hint. 
Uh, this tells us that uh, today we see a lot of evidence of Islamists wanting to take, uh, basically take over the world through a form of global jihad. But what we know is that that will never happen because Hagar is told to return to Sarai and to submit herself under her hand. Verse 10. Then the messenger of Yahweh said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. Remember, these are descendants of Avraham. I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. Verse 11. And the messenger of Yahweh said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has heard your affliction. So this passage tells us a lot of things. It tells us that Ishmael will be afflicted, but that Yahweh also will hear his affliction. So we take a look at the name Ishmael. It's Strong's Old Testament 3458. means Elohim will hear. So when we say the Shema, we say Shema Yisrael. This is Yishema El. It's will hear Elohim. So now we have Ishmael in play, and Ishmael is going to procreate. He's going to become a very numerous people, an Abrahamic people. And then we come to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. We come to the next phase of the covenant. So when Avram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. Verse 2. He says, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So then Avram fell on his face and Elohim talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant was with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Now this phrase, many nations is very important because as we're going to see later, we're going to see that Ishmael he will become, uh, he will have 12 princes, which represent the 12 uh, historically uh, Arabic Ishmaelite kingdoms, but he's going to be all one nation. So it's going to be the Muslim nation. Now here we have something different. In verse 5, Genesis 17 and verse 5, Yahweh says, no longer shall your name be called Avram, meaning exalted father. He says, but your name shall be called Avraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Now this is a challenge. And if you are considering that the gift of the spirit does away with the prophecies in the Tanakh or the Old Testament, then we have a question to answer. Because here we've already seen that we're, or we will see the evidence in just a moment that Ishmael will form a Muslim nation. Then we know there's also a Jewish nation, the nation of Judah or the state of Israel in the Middle East. But to have many nations requires more than two. And we take the word to the Hebrew and the word is hamon, which refers to a multitude of nations or a throng or a crowd or a tumult of nations. So there's supposed to be a tumult of nations that descend from Abraham's body. So here we have the Ishmaelites and now we have Judah, but that's only two and that's not enough. We need a tumult of nations. So let's continue. In Genesis 17 and verse 6, Yahweh promises Avram, he says, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations, again, plural, of you, and kings shall come from you. Verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you and your descendants after you. So now we have these many descendants. We're going to have many nations, at least three. And then the covenant is going to be established with his descendants after him. So let's carry on to verse 8. He says, also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their Elohim. And we're going to see uh, evidence. There's a lot of people who take a look at a particular passage in the Renewed Covenant written by Paul and say, no, 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 these things are all done away with. And we're going to take a look at that in a moment. They're not done away with. So verse 9. And Elohim said to Avraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, 
you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. And this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. We know that the Muslim people are circumcised, the Jewish people are circumcised, and some of the Christian peoples also, particularly the Ephraimites, become circumcised because that is part of the sign of the covenant. We see it especially among the Protestant peoples. So we continue forward. We come to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 15. It says, Then Elohim said to Avraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. And again, so very important language. She shall be a mother of nations. So again, now we're not talking about Ishmael because Ishmael descends through Hagar. We're talking about Sarah and Sarah is going to become a mother of nations. So this is the Jewish nation that we see in the state of Israel in the Middle East. And what other group of people? Spoiler alert, we're going to see the Ephraimite nation. We're also going to see Manasseh and Joseph. But mainly in this presentation, we're going to take a look at the Ephraimite nation. Because Sarah has to have more than one nation because it's prophesied right there in the text that nations, plural, shall come from her. So if you have a hard time believing this, uh, it's, you might not be the only one. Genesis 17 and verse 17, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to Elohim, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then Elohim said, no, in verse 19, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yitzchak, or Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So again, in these early portions of Genesis, of this prophetic book of Genesis, it's telling us that the covenant is going to be established through Abraham and then through Yitzhak and his descendants after him. And we already know it's going to be more than one nation, a Jewish nation and an Ephraimite nation, as we're going to see more evidence as this presentation continues. So we just take a quick look at Isaac's name, Yitzhak. It's Strong's Old Testament 3327. Yitzhak, it means laughter, or it can also mean mockery. And we're going to see this come into play in just a moment. Verse 20, he says, And for Ishmael, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes, which refer to the 12 uh, Arabic, the historic 12 Arabic kingdoms and will make him a great nation. So even though there's 12 countries, he has a singular nation, the Muslim nation. And then now we see also the Jewish nation and we're gonna see an Ephraimite nation. He says, verse 21, but he says, but my covenant I will establish with Yitzhak, with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. So it's a little bit easier to understand the spread of Avraham's children when we understand that both the children of Sarah and the children of Hagar are going to play into this blessing of physical multiplicity. So we come then to Genesis chapter 21 and verse 8. It says, So the child grew, Yitzhak grew and was weaned. And Avraham made a great feast on the same day that Yitzhak was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she'd born to Avraham, scoffing. And we remember that the name Yitzhak means laughter, also mocking. In verse 10, therefore she said to Avraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not inherit with my son, namely with Yitzhak. And the matter was very displeasing in Avraham's sight because of his son. But Elohim said to Avraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Yitzhak, your seed shall be called. That's a very important passage. In Yitzhak, 
your seed shall be called. And we come here, this is the verse that uh, the apostle Shaul or Paul refers to in Galatians chapter three and verse 16, where he says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is the Messiah. But notice here what it says. It says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now, I was always taught that this passage meant that the promises that were given to Abraham are no longer relevant because the promise is to the seed who is Messiah. But notice here, right here, and this is the Apostle Shaul's writings. In Galatians 3.16, it says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And so what we're talking about is promises, more than one promise. So we have a genetic component of the promise. We're also having a spiritual component of the promise. The necessary spiritual component will come through the seed, whom we will see is Messiah Yeshua. But he comes also, Messiah Yeshua comes through Yitzhak line. So there is still a genetic component to the prophecies. So we come further on to Genesis 21 and verse 15. Avraham has risen early in the morning. He's given a skin of water to Hagar and to her son Ishmael, and he sends them out into the wilderness. And there's not that much water. So sooner or later, it says, verse 15, and the water in the skin was used up, and Hagar placed the boy under one of the shrubs. And then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. And it's all this... Uh, archery symbolism is very important with regards to Ishmael because we're going to see later Ishmael will become an archer. And again, the theme, the meme of an archer is going to show up time and again throughout the scriptures. And we're going to see this later, even as late as the book of Revelation, we're going to see how the archers play into this thing. So she sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. And Elohim heard the voice of the lad. Then the messenger of Elohim called the Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for Elohim has heard the voice of the lad where he is, because his name is Yishmael, Yishmael, Elohim will hear. So he's definitely a covenant people, who will be brought in through belief in Messiah Yeshua one day. Come to verse 18. The messenger said, Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And once again, there's 12 princes, but only one Muslim nation. Important to remember that. Verse 19. Then Elohim opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So once again, here we have this remez or this hint early on uh, that uh, Hagar and her son Ishmael, are, they're found by water, which tells us they're found by the spirit, spiritually speaking. And so it's an indication that at some point in the future, just as Isaiah 11 and other places indicate, they will be called into the covenant. Verse 20. So Elohim was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And we're going to see this term archer show up again later. We'll see it in Genesis 49 and 50, and then we'll see how it uh, takes place in other places. Verse 21, he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So if we take a look at the wilderness of Paran, it's located in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, to the south of Israel. And this is where both Mecca and Medina are located. It's considered to be the cradle or what's called the cradle of Islam. And this is where Ishmael chose to dwell. And so while, uh, while Muhammad was the, we might call the father of the Muslim faith, we also see there's a high correspondence and a high correlation to the Ishmaelite seed line. Again, an Abrahamic faith, again, an Abrahamic people. And the fact that it is located to the south of the land of Israel is also very important. We get into Zechariah chapter 6 in the Revelation study. We're going to see that there's four spiritual horse forces that are released in Zechariah chapter 6. Red, white, black, 
and green. However, in Zechariah chapter 6, it's actually red, white, black, and dappled. And we see that the chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country, where the Japhethites spread out. And the white, which represent Ephraim, are going after them. And the dappled horses are going toward the south country, where Ishmael would later dwell. And that is why we say, that's why we believe that Ishmael uh, is, corresponds to Islam, is because we'll see the dappled horses later on become the green horses in the book of Revelation. Some translations read pale or gray, but in fact, it's, the word in Greek is chloros, which means green, as in because chlorophyll is green. And so what we're going to see is that the green horse is Islam. That's a lot of information. We're going to cover more details later. But there's certain key points that we need to take away from this. And one of the main key points is that Scripture contains both genetic and spiritual blessings. And the spiritual blessings don't do away with the genetic blessings, but the two things go together. We've seen that Avraham's older son was Ishmael, and we'll see that he will later become uh, the forerunner of the Muslim people. And yet the seed line, the covenant of the promise that was to come through Yeshua, came through the genetic seed line of Isaac. And to him it was promised that his descendants would inherit the land of Israel. So for more information or to see this study in written format, we encourage you to join us at www.nazarenisrael.org. And please join us again for part two, where we talk about Esau and his relationship to the red horse and the Roman Catholic faith. Shalom.